it has been said that Walt Disney was a remarkable man of vision. One of his character traits was that he never gave up. Would you believe that early in his career, he was fired from his first job at a newspaper company because they told him he didn't have any good ideas. <laughs> he started his career in Kansas City, but no one would buy his cartoons. Some politely pointed out that he would lack in the talent department. But Walt had this dream that he would not let go. And so he set out to prove the naysayers wrong. Eventually, he found a minister who would pay him a small sum to draw advertising pictures for his church. Now, I've thought about that. And I've wondered what they were advertising. Can you imagine Disney characters on our church stationery and on our banners? I'd be curious to know what he was drawing. He was so poor that the minister had pity on him and allowed him to sleep in the mouse-infested garage of the church. And in that garage, he made a friend. A mouse. And he gave him the name... A mouse that the world now knows. He finally began. He finally began to create his dream. He got his organization together. They moved into the entertainment industry. They began to just skyrocket and do these amazing things. But the early days were still difficult days. Walt would occasionally present some unbelievable, extensive dream to his board of some idea that he was entertaining. Almost without exception, the members of the board would gulp and blink and stare back at him in disbelief, resisting even the thought of what he was wanting to take them to the next level. But unless every member resisted the idea, Disney usually would not pursue it. Now you heard me correctly. Unless every member resisted the idea. He would not pursue it. Because unless every member resisted the idea, he knew that the dream was too small. And that it was not a place where he would spend his creative talents. Is it any wonder that Disneyland and Disney have become the realities that they are today? This is the type of faith that is required for visionaries in business, and service organizations, and research and development departments, but also for Christians and churches. Like Disney, we need to dream, and we need to dream big about what God can do if God had full access to our hearts. Stop and think about this. If God is the creator of the world, and he is, if he's the creator of the universe, and he is. If he is all-powerful, and he is. If he is omniscient, and he is. If he created you and me and everything in our world. Then think about what could be accomplished when we work in cooperation with him. Would any dream be too small? Would any vision be incapable if we were, if we were partnered with God? In that vision. Walt Disney World opened in 1974 in Orlando, Florida. Mrs. Disney was sitting that morning beside Walter Cronkite, famed commentator. Walt Disney had passed away some years earlier. And Walter Cronkite is sitting there at the grand opening of Disney World in 1974. He's sitting there with Mrs. Disney and he wants to say something. He wants to say something appropriate, something that, that sounds smart. He wants to kind of recognize Walt in some way. And so he opens his mouth, and this is what comes out. He says, Mrs. Disney, wouldn't it be just wonderful if Walt was here to see us today? And this is what she said. She said, unless he had seen it first, you would not be seeing it today. 
That story, in my mind, so effectively illustrates what it means to have a vision. To have a vision for something means that you can see it so clearly in your mind that the details, that every part of it, are just they're just vivid for you. It's like you literally see it on the screen of your mind. Before it actually takes place, you can visualize it. You can predict how the thing will develop. You can see how it will come to life, how it will function, how it will operate in the real world. Coaches often do this with their athletes. They'll take their athletes through these visioning exercises in which the player is told to imagine, imagine, pretend it, almost like you fantasize about it over and over and over again. I want you to imagine the successful catch or touchdown or throw or shot. Imagine throwing the ball. Imagine doing the ball exactly what you want to do, want it to do. Imagine what it will look like. Imagine what it will feel like as it leaves the end of your fingertips. Imagine what it will feel like when you score. Imagine what it will be like when you win. Or when a bride plans her wedding, she will often envision what the day is going to look like with amazing accuracy. And that vision leads to careful planning. And the more careful the planning is, the higher the probability that the day will unfold exactly as she had envisioned. We reserve this term visionary for those leaders who are able to instill a company or an organization or a church or a group with a vision that is so clear, that is so compelling, that the organization almost just subconsciously moves in the direction of the vision. In fact, Proverbs verse 29, chapter 29, verse 18, says that where there is no vision, the people perish. I can't think of any place where that would be more true than in the church. It is important for God's people to have a vision. But let me ask this question. How do God's people get a vision? How do you have a vision? How is vision developed? Is there a is there a downloadable vision app that's available on iTunes? How about a website that you can go to and order a customized vision? Or a software package, Vision 2.0. Is it okay if you borrow a vision from a successful church down the street? Or does the General Conference, our world headquarters, do they have a list of approved sample visions on their website that are adaptable to Seventh-day Adventist churches? This morning, let me suggest to you that God speaks. In other words, God gives a vision within the context of community. I believe that God speaks and since God speaks through community, the vision, that which most accurately represents God's will for the church, will come from within the community of the church. Look at this text with me. It's the opening text of the book of Hebrews. Flip over to the New Testament. Look at this with me. Hebrews chapter 1. Paul is beginning his letter with this single word, God. And he says this. God, who at various times and different ways spoke in times past. So he's saying God has spoken in times past. God is not some elusive, shadowy, angelic, cloudy figure that we can't hear or understand or know. God, who at various times and different ways spoke in times past, how did he speak? He spoke to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us. So Paul says, you know, in the olden days, God spoke. He spoke at different times, and he spoke in different ways, but he spoke to us through the prophets. In these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. And I love the next verses of this passage. Paul, within the, what, within the first, the first, uh, second verse, when he mentions Christ, the whole rest of the chapter is just Paul just doing this. He's just gushing forth with emotion and celebration about Christ. Listen to the qualifiers that he attaches once he introduces Jesus. Then he says, Christ, the Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, 
through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he himself had purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he spends the whole rest of the chapter just celebrating Christ, just talking about Christ. He draws out these illustrations. He says, you know, the angels, they're great, but they're not like Christ. And over and over again, he just talks about Christ. The whole first part of the chapter. God, who spoke... In times past, in various ways, spoke to our fathers through prophets, has in these last days spoken to us through his son. How does God speak to us? Through his son. But let's take it, let's take the concept a step further. God has spoken to us through his son. And God has spoken in various ways and in times past through his son. Turn over to the book of Matthew chapter 18. We're going to take this another step further. Matthew chapter 18. And I'm going to read verse 18. Jesus is speaking now and he says, I surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if any two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Look at verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. God speaks in community. Do you see it? Right there in verse 20. God spoke in times past to the prophets. He spoke to our fathers through the prophets. He has in these last days spoken to us through his son. But now, because his son lives in us, when we are together in community, when the two or three are together and they agree in his name, God speaks to the people through community. It's becoming clear in the text, isn't it? Now, let's take a moment to clarify this text, because some people get a hold of this text, and they do some things that are kind of wonky. They think that we can now do anything that we want to do if we agree and we're Christians, that we can make anything happen, because the Bible said that if we bound it, it's bound in heaven, if we loose it, it's loosed in heaven. Let me tell you what the text does not say. The text does not say this. It does not say that if Brother Jim Gurkin and I agree that we don't like somebody, who should we pick on, Jim? Where's Trevor? <laughs> oh, Trevor. I'm glad to see you, bro. You're going to help me with my sermon today, aren't you? What the text does not say, it does not say that if Jim and I agree that we don't like Trevor, and we're going to bound to Trevor, whatever that means, that Trevor is now bound. That's not what the text says. It doesn't say that because we agreed that we don't like him and we're going to do something to him, that now God has to do it because there's a text that says so. Right? That's not what the text is saying. The text is not attempting to circumvent God's authority with human authority. The text does not sanction the claim that if we agree to do something ungodly, that now we have God over a barrel and God has to do it because Matthew 18 20 says so. We don't get to dictate matters upon which heaven is silent just because Christ's followers agree on a certain thing. So the meaning of the text is this, that the church on earth will require only what heaven requires and will prohibit only what heaven prohibits. And that's what takes place when the, in the community of Christ, when Christ dwells among them. There's safety in what God is saying from community because if someone steps off to the right or to the left, if someone says something wonky, the community is there to bring them back to the sure word of God and to the influence of the Holy Spirit to hold that message accountable to what God is actually doing in heaven. The thought that Jesus dwells among his people and through that indwelling he speaks to the community, that's an incredible thought. Stop and think through what that means this morning. It means that God is here among us as believers of like Christ. And God speaks through that body this morning. Verse 11 in Matthew 18 is an important guiding principle. What would God be saying? Verse 11 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. When the community comes together and they have this burden, they have this ache in their heart, to do what Jesus did, to seek and to save what is lost. We know that this is one of the ways that God is speaking and that we're accurately hearing what God is saying into the community. 
Now this, this idea that God speaks in community, in no way does it cheapen the voice of the pastor or the elders or church leaders. But it simply recognizes that there is this collective spiritual bleeding which takes place when God is among his people. Some of you might be a little skeptical this morning. Let's look at another passage. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. This is actually a quote that comes from us from Joel chapter 2. And Paul has pulled this quote from Joel chapter 2. Or excuse me, Luke has pulled this quote from Joel chapter 2. Look what he says here in verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Let me ask you, are we living in the last days? Do you see evidence that we are living in the last days? Anybody ever watch the news? Anyone ever read the newspaper? Anyone keep up with what's taking place in global politics and cultural development all the rest of that? I have a sense that we're living in the last days. Bible prophecy teaches us very clearly that human history is on its way to a rapid conclusion. Human history as we understand it. And it shall come to pass in the last days, it says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And on my men's servant, my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above, and the signs of the earth, and blood and fire and vapor and smoke, and the sun will be turned into darkness. He continues with his prophecy. God speaks in community. In the last days, he will prophesy through children, through our sons, through our daughters, through our ladies, through our old men. Don't you just long to be a part of a church that does that? Don't you long to be a part of a church that allows for that? And that because of that, we receive those things from him that we ask. This is the blessing that God promises us. So, in the time that remains today, I want us to do something a little different. If God speaks in community, and if the sermon time is the time when God speaks, then could I invite you this morning to be more than just a listener to the sermon? Could I invite you to help me craft the remainder of this sermon? And even to preach the remainder of this sermon? Some of you are looking at me like, oh, he's getting weird now. <laughs> he better not be trying to get me up on that platform in line. I'm not going to go. Well, am I going to invite you up to the pulpit this morning? Here's the truth. I want to hear from each one of you this morning. I want you to have the opportunity to speak and the opportunity to share and the opportunity to reflect with your church family. I would like for every one of us to have the opportunity to speak, but... It's kind of hard to get everybody up to the pulpit at the same time, isn't it? So what we're going to do is this. We're going to separate right now into some various groups where we can talk, where this morning we can allow God to speak in community. This is a little different for us. We've never done this before. Think of it in this way. Think of it kind of like the foot washing service on communion Sabbath. You know, foot washing, we come in, we, we start the service together, and then we separate and we go do the foot washing, and then we come back. That's what we're going to do this morning, right now, right? I want to separate you into smaller groups, and you're going to have a small group leader, sort of a discussion leader, a discussion facilitator, that will take you to a specific place somewhere here in the church building, and you're going to spend about 15 or 20 minutes together, and that discussion leader is going to take you through a series of just three questions, where you're going to talk a little bit about your vision, your values, your understanding of what it is that God is doing here in our church family. I want you to think of this as though you are helping me craft and preach the sermon. Because God speaks in community. And when we get done with that, after your, your group has their discussion time, I want you to come back to the sanctuary. We will conclude and worship together. And I'll talk with you a little bit about what will happen with that information. Okay? It's a little different for us. We've never done it before. I want to tell you it went really, really, really well service. And I'm very excited about this. It's kind of a high Sabbath for us. I'm very excited about that. So, small group leaders, would you stand please?
Now, I don't know a great way to get us all into individual groups. I would like for us to have groups of no larger than 10. It's okay if we have a group of six or eight, but please, groups no larger than 10. So if you see a small group leader that you would like to be with, you are welcome to attach yourself to that small group leader until their group reaches 10. Small group leaders, as soon as you get 10, you know where your designated spots are, uh, upstairs and downstairs as well. If you haven't had a designated spot, then you're one of the groups that will stay here in the sanctuary. But we want the initial groups to go out because we want to thin the sanctuary out as much as possible. All right? This is going to be fun. Let's give it a try. You're dismissed. Did you enjoy that? I floated, I heard, I just floated just briefly with most of the group, so I heard some good discussion going on, which I love that. I think that's fantastic. I just want to say this before we close worship. I want you to know that I am going to read every single one of these, and not just me, but we have a visioning, a visioning team that we have pulled together here in our church. This visioning team has met twice over the last six months or so, and thank you, thank you. Over the last three months or so, our visioning team has come together three different times. We're actually meeting again this afternoon. We're going to have a little luncheon together and meet again this afternoon. And we're going to start perusing uh, some of this information. This week, I'm going to have Valencia collate this information. And I'm going to have all this information pulled together, pulled into one place. And I'm not going to try to do a copy for everybody just because, you know, we've already got enough national debt going on in the nation. So I'm going to have those available I have several copies of those available next Sabbath out on the greeter station, uh, it, it, it right here on the greeter's table. I would encourage you to take a few moments to peruse through that, just look at that and look at the collation. But I want to say this to you. I want you to know that I take this very seriously. This is not just an exercise so that people feel good when they talk, but we actually want this information. We will look at it, we will consider it, we will study it, we will collate it, we will spend time with it, and we're actually going to begin that in about another hour or so. We're actually going to begin uh, paying attention to that. I care about what you think. I care about what is working well, what is not working well, and what it is that we need to do to improve and to strengthen and to grow this church's ministry. And I say this to the church board all the time. None of us is as smart as all of us. Right? And I, and I say that to you sincerely. I very much covet your input and the things that are important to you and the things that you would like to see us work into our future plans for the future of our ministry. As Bob Thompson told you this morning, we've got some wonderful plans that we're, we're thinking about for next year. And we'll be talking a little bit more about those later in the month and then through the month of December as well, just positioning ourselves for some new ministry initiative that will take place in 2013. And this is one of those very, very important steps to kind of open up dialogue and to take temperature, and to have input. We would ask for your input. We would also ask for your support, and we would ask for your buy-in as we roll out some of those ministry plans for 2013. And so I just want to say that to you. I care about what you have said today. I thank you for your contribution, and I want you to know that I will take care of that. Uh, I, I will take that very seriously, and that we will incorporate that. I am excited about what God is doing in this church the visioning team has been a very exciting process for me. As I said, we have, we have our second meeting last night. Our third meeting is tomorrow. It is today. And just to sit and to take kind of a big umbrella view, the big, the big view of what we're doing, where God has led us in the past, and where we're going in the future, what our strengths are, what our giftedness are, what our resources are, and what are the things that we need to do to position ourselves to grow as a church and to have a stronger ministry. That is an exciting discussion. And that's the discussion that we will continue to have together as a congregation in 2014. And so thank you for your input. And let's just look forward to what God has planned for us as we grow spiritually and as we grow individually and as we grow as a community of believers and as we grow as a church and as we grow in what God has called us to do. Here on our little piece of real estate in South, Southwest Raleigh, uh, Southeast, Southwest Raleigh. Would you stand with me as we have prayer and we'll close out the worship service today. Let's pray. Lord, we love these blessings that you continue to give us week after week. As you bring the community together, as you speak in community, Lord, it gives us a sense that you are at the helm in this church, that you are leading, that you are guiding, that you approve of the ministry that we are conducting, and that we are becoming that city 
that is set upon a hill that is so light that it shines in the nighttime and all who pass by and see it and are invited into that city's gates to be a part of the community that takes place there. Lord, we love that. We love this church. We love this message. We love the way that you lead and guide in our lives. And we are anticipating that you are going to do wonderful things through us as we wrap up this year and embark upon a new